Uh, thank you for having me uh, to give a lecture about hydroxychloroquine, a wonder drug for all SLE patients. Uh, these are my disclosures. If you do not follow me on Twitter, please be my guest. It's Lupin reference. And I uh, have been uh, very privileged because I've been given a very hot topic. You know, everybody's been talking about hydroxychloroquine for the last past years. Uh, the number of publications in PubMed has been uh, increasing quite slightly during the last decade. But with COVID, it really boomed and now is a little bit going down. So we're going to talk about hydroxychloroquine, but what is this molecule? Well, this is it. This is the snapshot. Uh, I'm sure you know that it was originally used to treat malaria. This is why it's called an anti-malarial. And actually its main indications in 2023 are systemic lupus, lupus, cutaneous lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, malaria with great cautions because there are many areas of resistance and obviously not COVID. I'm sure you knew that already. So what are the mechanisms of action of hydroxychloroquine? Well, this is a figure I made to summarize what we know about the immunology of systemic lupus. I think you're going to tell me this is very complicated and you are correct. Um, I just want to highlight a little part, which is this one, uh, where the ultraviolet light will act upon the keratinocytes. Uh, there will be some apoptosis, production of apoptotic bodies, and inside these apoptotic bodies, you have nuclear antigens, DNA and RNA. And this is absolutely crucial because it will trigger some specialized cells, the PDCs, plasmacytoic dendritic cells, to produce interferon alpha. And how does this work? Well, we are equipped with toll-like receptors. There are sensors for the innate immune system, and some of these sensors detect um, the inflammation. So what are the mechanisms of action of hydroxychloroquine? Well, this is a summary of what we know about the immunology of systemic lupus. And I already know what you're going to tell me, that it is very complicated. And you are correct. Um, I'd like to make a focus on uh, this part of the screen, where uh, the keratinocytes get ultraviolet light, and it makes them die. They enter into apoptosis. And uh, this releases DNA and RNA, our nucleic acids. And I'm sure you know that we are equipped with sensors for these molecules, and these sensors are inside some specialized types of cells called PDCs. And these cells will produce interferon alpha, which is an immense booster of the immune system. And these sensors, they are called TLRs, toll-like receptors, and some of these TLRs, number three, seven, eight, and nine, they detect nucleic acids. And this is precisely the main mechanism of action of hydroxychloroquine. HEQ is an inhibitor of TLR nine and seven. It has lots of different uh, properties, but this is the main mechanism of action. So what are the clinical benefits of hydroxychloroquine in SLE? Well, there are many of these benefits. The first ones are the control of disease activity, a reduction in the proportion of flares and the reduction in the risk of damage. But we have to know that the evidence for that is not so strong. Um, if you look at the number one paper that is quoted, which is the uh, Canadian HCQ study group, this is a New England paper from 1991, you see a few things. First, this is not about hydroxychloroquine, it's about withdrawing hydroxychloroquine, which is not exactly the same. And then you see that the sample size is actually quite low. And this is the best evidence we have in a randomized controlled trial. For the other properties, what we know, we know it through observational studies. So this is mostly statistical association. So based on these uh, studies, we know that HCQ is recommended for all patients with systemic lupus, unless it's contraindicated. I'll come back to that in a minute. And when we look at the actual proportion of patients receiving hydroxychloroquine in real life, in observational studies, in trials, it's always a bit surprising because it's not very high, usually around 70 to 80%. So I think we can definitely do better. So how shall we start, how shall we prescribe hydroxychloroquine in systemic lupus? Well, obviously there are a few contraindications, it's always the same with drugs. Uh, the first one is allergy. Um, one 
which I think is important to mention, is the risk of pre existing retinopathy. In that case, you need some extra caution, and it's even a contraindication if it's due to previous use of antimalarials. But I have to say that this is not very common in young women with systemic lupus. Usually, the baseline screening that is recommended is usually not very useful. And I must say that in the British guidelines, UK guidelines, the baseline screening has actually been removed. There's a risk of uh, renal failure that uh, necessitates dose adaptation for hydroxychloroquine. There is a recommendation by EULA, but it's not based on very robust data. Uh, and it is to decrease the daily dose of HCQ by 50% in patients who have EGFR of less than 30 milliliters per minute. Um, those adaptation is occasionally recommended in case of a hepatic failure. A word about a J6PD a deficiency. Uh, this is a word of caution. The literature is quite reassuring. Pregnancy and breastfeeding is usually quite okay, considered safe by most experts, although you have some mentions on, on the label for the drug. And I think it's important to say that some drug may interact with HEQ, especially the drug that leads to QT prolongation. In that case, an EKJ is needed. Uh, but uh, we have a reassuring study. So I think it's great to know that uh, it's published by Ockin Arthritis and Rheumatism this year, 2022. You see that the likelihood, the risk of arrhythmia is the same as uh, the general population when you initiate HCQ in rheumatoid arthritis and systemic lupus at normal doses. So this is very reassuring to know. Uh, there are three diseases, myasthenia, psoriasis, and uh, porphyria, for which there is a word of caution uh, written on the labels. Uh, the FDA says that HCQ should not be used in these conditions unless, in the judgment of the physician, the benefits outweighs the possible risk. And of course, there are some dietary recommendations. Uh, I'd be careful about diabetes. Uh, some patients may uh, be warned about the risk of hyperglycemia, especially in combination with um, some drugs that make uh, glycemia lower by themselves. Now there's a bit of controversy about the dose of hydroxychloroquine. Um, it is recommended at a dose not exceeding five milligram per kilogram of real body weight in the EULA recommendations. And it's true that when you read the label, uh, most of the tablets or capsules are 200 milligrams of ATQ sulfate which is 155 uh, base HEQ, but you can see that the recommended dose is 200 to 400 milligrams per day. It can be administered as a single or in two divided doses. This does not really matter. But you see that doses above 400 milli milligrams per day are not recommended. And uh, well, we are quite lucky because there's a very interesting paper published in the JAMA last year uh, it shows that the risk of SLE flare is actually increased in patients who receive a daily dose of 5 milligram kilogram or less. So it really is about benefit risk ratio. Can we measure hydroxychloroquine blood levels? Well, the answer is yes. Um, we are all equipped with uh, metabolic enzymes and you know that there's a very strong inter-individual variability of the blood levels. They actually do not correlate very well with the daily doses. So this is why it's interesting to measure uh, the amount in the blood because you cannot really guess from the daily dose. And there are some great studies, especially those from my colleague Nathalie Costello at Chalumeau, um, showing that there is a threshold around 750, maybe up to 1,200 nanogram per milliliter. Um, at which you optimize the efficacy of uh, hydroxychloroquine. But this has not been proven in a prospective manner. This is cross-sectional, so a word of caution is needed. Uh, with a colleague of mine, uh, Francois Chassé, who is a dermatologist specialized in CLE, we have shown prospectively that when the patients have blood levels of less than 750, increasing the dose to bring them above 750 results in an improvement of the lupus rash when it's refractory. But it's not formally proven for systemic manifestations of lupus. And on the other hand, Michel Petrie has shown that when you use doses of more than 1,200 um, nanogram per milliliter in the blood, you increase the risk of retinal toxicity. 
So I, I think the real target, if you are able to measure, would be between 750 and 1,200 nanogram per milliliter. I'd like to say a word about therapeutic adherence because cystomicular like is a chronic disease. And well, some patients start the treatment, but sometimes they're discouraged and they stop taking the treatment. And we, ask, we actually ask them, uh, this is a survey that was performed at the uh, European level. There are more than 2,000 locus patients who fulfill adherence questionnaires. And you can see that what is reported by the patients, and it's not so good, a mean adherence rate around 70%. Also, I have to say that something that is interacting with HCQ is smoking. And I think it's worth mentioning to the patients that smoking decreases the likelihood of skin response in lupus by 50%. So now we know everything about the way to start hydroxychloroquine. What's the follow-up? Well, there are some side effects that are worth knowing. First is gastrointestinal disorder. This is quite common, a bit of nausea, abdominal pain but it can lead to interruption of treatment. Of course, there's the risk of retinopathy, and you know that a specific monitoring is needed. And what is interesting is that the risk of retinopathy is strongly increased when you use the daily doses of more than five milligram per kilogram per day. So it's really a trade-off. And I think this is why we have this recommendation to perform an eye checkup. This is usually recommended annually after five years of treatment with hydroxychloroquine. But there are some exceptions. Yearly from HCQ starts, a follow-up is recommended in case of low BMI, renal failure, use of tamoxifen, or pre-existing macular anomaly. Skin rash can appear uh, during uh, HCQ treatment. You have to be careful that this does not turn into adject, which is acute generalized uh, pustulosis, which can be quite severe. There is also a risk uh, which is minimal of cardiac toxicity with around 100 cases reported. Uh, in that case, um, an EKJ and a cardiac uh, MRI is actually needed uh, if you suspect this diagnosis. Patients have to be informed of the risk of hypoglycemia, especially if they have diabetes. There's a slight risk of cytopenia, so I think it's great to monitor the blood count. And also, this is quite rare, but there's a risk of vacuolar myopathy, uh, for which, uh, well, CK usually increased uh, and, um, electromyography and muscular biopsy can be performed. So the way I manage these adverse events is quite simple. In case of minor adverse events, I usually try to stop HCQ for some time and then to restart progressively or to reduce the dose, occasionally to switch to chloroquine. Uh, but in case of a severe adversity then, for instance, uh, retinopathy, you have to stop HGQ and it, it is contraindicated. So when uh, we treat the patient and the patient enters remission, how shall we manage HGQ? Um, well, we did a survey around 300 physicians worldwide, said that in around 48% of cases, when uh, lupus was in remission, they reduced the dose of hydroxychloroquine. Well, this is quite intuitive, but actually we have this new study published in ARD last year, a study by Brazil, showing that when um, lupus has been in remission for one year, decreasing or discontinuing HCQ increases the risk of flare by two to three times. So my advice is to go on until you observe some retinal toxicity, and the risk for that is actually quite low in the end. So these are my take-home messages. Hydroxychloroquine is an anti-malarial, but it's approved for systemic lupus. It has multiple mechanisms of action, including blocking TLRs, especially TLR 7 and 9. There are many clinical benefits. Everybody is convinced, but the level of evidence is usually not very high. And usually the doses we use are between 200 and 400 milligrams per day in one or two divided doses with a bit of trade-off. Less than 5 milligram per kilogram per day is less retinal toxicity but more flares, while when you use doses of more than 5 milligram per kilogram per day, you have more retinal toxicity but you have less flares. So this is really to discuss with your patient at the individual level. And of course, you can always measure ATQ blood levels. The thresholds have not been formally validated in a prospective manner. I think it's important to, to put the emphasis on the fact that the efficacy of ATQ is decreased on smokers. 
Obviously, the main follow-up has to be for the eye. You need to detect infraclinical retinopathy, and this would lead to the interruption of the treatment. And well, we now know that uh, when um, SLE is in remission, it is better to go on with the same doses because discontinuation of dose reduction in patients that have been in remission for one year leads to more flare. Thank you very much, and I am now fully open for questions and answers.